All right, we are officially live. Hi, everyone at home. Welcome to the very first class intensive for Warner Herzog's class intensive discussion for Warner Herzog's class intensive. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure we have good um, sound, good, good vision. You guys can see us. So for those of you who are at home in the chat room, can you please let me know if you can see us? Oh. And I have it open somewhere in the background. And let me close it so I can hear myself. So it does seem like we have good sound and vision. I don't need you guys to tell me um, I had it on the background. So it looks good. So let's get started. Let's have everyone, we're going to have our hosts introduce themselves first. And then I'll explain how, we'll, um, how this will work. So let's have you guys, let's start with Alana. Hi, uh, I'm Alana. And I used to be a, um, an actor. I'm now a writer and a developmental editor. And that's in the book world, not in the film world. Right, go ahead and, and Clark. Yeah, hey guys, my name is Clark. Uh, I used to work in advertising a while back and uh, decided to pursue filmmaking full time uh, about six, seven years ago. And I've been doing that as an actor, a writer, producer, and director. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Herzog, so here I am. Cool, thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Kari. I'm Kari, uh, I have a background in literature. Uh, I'm currently working as a bureaucrat uh, I have a strong interest in film, and Herzog is fantastic. So uh, this just seemed like a great opportunity to get my feet wet. Awesome. Thank you for joining us, all three of you. Um, so to everyone at home and everyone here, how it's going to work, we have our discussion topics, which have been posted in the Facebook group. But if you ha don't have the discussion topics, I will post a link in the chat room in just a second so you can find them, and you can go download them real quick and follow along. We'll go through the discussion topics. The first about 30 minutes, we'll be going through um, lesson topics, so um, things about the lessons from this week. And then the last about 20 minutes, we'll be talking about um, your assignments, what you've been working on, and how you got to where you're working on this week, and what you're planning on working through the class intensive. Um, but first, yeah, let's start talking about the lessons. So we started this week with the first four lessons. Um, lesson one was just an introduction from Warner. Uh, he brought up a really interesting phrase that we wanted to talk about, um, which was a good soldier of cinema. So our question to you guys is, what does it mean to be a good soldier of cinema? Um, and bonus question, do you feel like you are a good soldier of cinema? Um, so you guys, what do you think? <laughs> Why don't you guys go first? Oh my goodness. I say, Clark, you're ready. I can okay, tell. well, geez, I mean, you know, uh, clearly a very subjective question, uh, both parts of that. You know, I think, like, having lived in Los Angeles now for about 10 years, I think right now what, what being a good soldier of cinema means to me uh, and what I think Werner Herzog really uh, does a good job kind of uh, being, being a good example of is being authentic in his voice and his expression of his voice. And, you know, uh, and I think that that to me, that's what it means to be a good soldier of cinema is to, to stay true to your authentic voice, regardless of what kind of pressures are going on in the industry or whatever around you. Um, and am I a good soldier of cinema? Wow, that is like a seriously <laughs> question. I can say this, I'm trying to be. All right. Hey, that's great. <laughs> Alana, um, Kari, sure, what do you guys I'll, think? I'll go. Yeah. I, um, over in our group A, I wrote a post. And I hate when I do this. When I write things down, then I like move on in my mind. So I explained my whole being a good soldier there. But basically, I think as an artist, you're either fierce or you're not fierce. And I don't mean that in like, what is her name? Tyra. I don't mean that ty in <laughs> that way. Um, there's an intensity that happens when I was painting. Um, I used to do a very similar thing as Werner with the, you know, raise yourself to a certain place. I would listen to music and I would actually read about explorers. But I, when I would start painting, I, I would just paint for hours and hours and hours until I just was on the floor. And then I would crawl into the shower because I'd be covered in paint, <laughs> then go to bed. There's, so that either you have this fierceness to explore and discover the creative experience of your mind relating to the world, or you don't. And I think you can be born with it, or I think you can develop it. Life has a way of really Sorry, your volume out. just cut off at the end. After you said, I think you can be born with it? 
Oh, um, I think you can be born with it, but you can also develop it from hell, basically. <laughs> Life <laughs> will dole out a lot of lessons. And I think it, through getting through those, you develop your soldierness. Uh, my dad was literally a soldier in the army uh, for 20 plus years. And he, I guess they have a term for it, he worked for it. He wasn't just, you know, a high up officer. He, he was in the trenches. Um, so we have to be in the trenches. So if you're a good soldier of cinema, you are going to be in the trenches, getting dirty, doing the hard work, and your mind has to be willing to go there. Yeah, so to That's be able to, to very go through the trials and tribulations. Answer. Yeah, it's, it's an intense world, and I am definitely a soldier of cinema. I'm definitely a soldier of every kind of art. <laughs> I have no question. And it's, it's a tough, tough place. People might romanticize it, but it's a tough place. And if you have that inside of you, you can't just ignore it. Totally. Kari, what do you think? Yeah. I, I like the idea of the expression of being in the trenches because it is an everyday thing. You, to be a soldier of cinema means holding yourself to a particular standard constantly, even when you're not quote unquote on duty, because yeah. you are an example of this. Um, I think the, the idea of authenticity sticking to your vision and how it is a duty and a privilege in a lot of ways to be able to, to do this. Um, I don't know that I'm a soldier of cinema. I'm enthusiastic. I just, you know, got my head shaved for, for training. Um, but I, I think I've been AWOL a bit, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm becoming converted. It's, it's almost like we're, it's a soldier of cinema, but it's a guerrilla army. Fair enough. Yeah. So it's not like a specific training you're saying, but it can be like underground, anything, as long as you're going for cinematic experience. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think Werner wants us to follow what he's done exactly. I think no. that might creep him out, as it yeah, should anyone. <laughs> so, Yeah, I, I said something similar. I was thinking like a good soldier cinema who doesn't, like, in, in my mind, with, with Werner, he's just so into filmmaking and into, like, the history behind it. I mean, the first few lessons of the class, he's talking about great films from, you know, when he was younger and things that were made maybe before his time or whatever. Um, and then he just has such a passion about what's happening and he looks very specific um, aspects of each film that he like finds and pulls out. Um, so to me, like a good soldier of cinema is not just someone who's like, yeah, they're working on films and they're making, they're, you know, getting their hands dirty and they're getting into it and they're making stuff and being creators, but they're also someone who thinks about like the history of filmmaking and what's been done before. And they think either how can I build upon it or how can I take what people have learned and use that into my own work. Um, and that, I think to me that was like more of like the good part. Like anybody can be like a soldier of cinema and making films and like doing whatever, but the good part are the people who are like knowledgeable of like the history and are putting that into their, into their work. Um, that's what I thought. Um, I wanted to read a couple comments from the chat room from Naomi. She says, um, I think a good soldier is to pursue your goal is to produce your film despite any obstacles. And she agrees with the point about sticking to authenticity, but from their experience thus far, um, she thinks of a soldier of cinema, you should also be willing to compromise to adapt your story based on the location and actors you're able to find. Do you yeah, think that's that, part of it too? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, if you're not practical about things, you're not gonna end up with a finished product. Yeah. I don't wanna use the word Art compromise product. for it. It's more like adapt or show resiliency because it's not, I mean, I don't necessarily see that as being a compromise unless you feel like you're letting yourself down in a way. Yeah, I, think I think there's a good point. We're all going to have our own um, vocabulary. Um, so however we need to internalize it, but um, I think the point of being practical, um, and I forgot which was your choice, but <laughs> that pleasure word is absolutely integral to uh, succeeding. Yeah. Sorry, Clark. That's all right. I cut you off. All right. Cool, Clark, did you have something to say? I was just going to say, I think there's, there's, a, there's a couple of aspects to that. I think when I was, when I was suggesting stick to your authenticity, and I was, I was just referring to the, there's a compromise of like, right, you've got your actors and they're your actors. You've got your set and that's your set or your location or whatever. And you've got to be flexible to accept 
inspiration and accidents as they occur yeah. because those are wonderful gifts. That's one thing. There's another thing of you should you you know you should make your film this way because if you do, we'll give you some extra money or don't write your script this way. Nobody ever watches anything that's not three act story structure. Look at all these Marvel movies. That's the only thing that, that gets made today. So that's kind of the context of what I was talking about when I was saying really stick true to your authentic voice. That voice can be expressed myriad ways, but a lot of people are going to try to tell you ways that aren't a part of that. That that was just some context to what I was referring to. Yeah, that was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and I think, I think that someone has their, um, I'm being a big guy, does someone have their volume on? Me? You mean, no, no, no. I'm just getting a big guy. I'm just sitting here duplicating everything like twice. I'm just sitting up. <laughs> um, I can do headphones if you think that'll help. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think that I think that was solved. Solved. It looks like the echo is gone now, so I think that was it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, okay. So I want to give you a couple comments from people in the chat room. John Ellsworth says, "I agree, and I do consider myself a good soldier of cinema. Made Super Eight films as a kid. Took many classes on the subject over the year." When I lived in Boston, I practically lived at the Brattle Theater. Someone who's put in the time and has like been really like since you were young making Super 8 films. It's really cool. Um, yeah, that is. Cool. I, Andrew says to be a good soldier of cinema, you do absolutely anything you have to do in order to make it work, even if that means eating the spoonful <laughs> of maggots yourself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which is true. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll move us on to the next lesson. So lesson two, um, which was the lesson about. Well, basically, Werner says you need to watch films and basically study them. Um, and in that lesson, Werner talks about uh, these film, for, French film directors watching foreign films without subtitles to learn about the stories. Yeah. Um, and as, the question, I guess, for you guys is how do you think these film, watching films these way um, helps you learn about the aspects of visual storytelling, like flow, suspense, and getting the audience on your side? And what's the difference between so, like watching just the visual representation as opposed to watching it with like the, the language that you know and can hear and understand? As soon as you turn off the, the sound, you, your eyes are going to notice the framing, the light, how, you're telling the, how they are telling the story with light. To me, that's very important. You're going to um, notice more when they go in for close-up. I think it's a, an excellent tool to turn off the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess just, and I would, I would just uh, reiterate that or just elaborate on it. I think, uh, you know, especially in today's day and age, and people talk a lot about this uh, golden era of television that we live in, for example, and we have shows like Mad Men and, I, you know, on and on, right? We could go on and on all these shows. And, and people really refer to that. And if you notice, almost all of our really popular storytelling today, it's it, it is hugely dialogue driven and very, very little of the storytelling is done visually. Uh, so in my mind, to me, as I define cinema, it's almost like anti-somatic. Uh, it's very dialogue driven. When you turn off the sound, uh, you are really focusing just on the visual storytelling aspect of the medium. And uh, I think that's vital, and I think we're losing a lot of that today, uh, not to get on the soapbox about it. But yeah, so I think when you turn off the sound, when you've got no dialogue, or you're watching a foreign film without subtitles, you really start to hone in on how much of the story can be told visually. And like Alana, you referred to light, but all aspects of the mise-en-scene, framing, camera, becoming a character, everything like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's vital. Bad, yeah, I, what you're really bringing up, which is just the behavior. For me, that behavior is so important, and what you just said, absolutely, we can now see the behavior of what of the people, the, whatever's happening on screen. Getting away from the face twisters where you've actually got the engagement of the body in place, the body is in motion and interaction. Um, yeah, getting away from the talking heads, even yeah. though they're, they're still there talking as heads, mm -hmm. but now we're going to watch nuance. Right, what they're saying, I mean, it should be able to carry over. There's a reason why silent cinema was so popular. Not just that it was a novelty, but you know, you got the occasional inner title, but you really could follow a complex emotional narrative structure experience just by watching the people. Um, yeah. 
I mean, some, it's funny that the, it was the Frenchmen who were watching foreign films because some of the best examples of how to, to draw a viewer in have, have come from French cinema. Um, Can know. anyone speak about um, the sound with foreign films? Uh, it seems like that would be very much a priority. Is you were bringing up, uh, Kari, the um, silent era, and without the people playing at the piano, or the actual soundtracks, I guess didn't, they had music with it, right? Yeah, there was um, usually a, a score. And in fact, it's, I know it's become popular here in Austin. I don't know uh, about other places, but getting a live band, a composer to write a new score and to have wow. you know, contemporary musicians perform something. In fact, um, there was a group uh, several years ago who did uh, from the original Nosferatu composed a new score and actually performed it live, which is, uh, cool. was chilling. I mean, it was very effective. It added a lot to the film. Um, so having that kind of thing, I mean, not, it seems like turning off the volume on a film would be like uh, turning off one of your senses because the, the sound is such a, a critical thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking like w without, language when you are, don't have when you don't understand the language or when like a silent film the, when there isn't a language you are forced to rely on your senses and so important when you watch a film is the sound no matter what the sound is mm -hmm. it completely affects the way that you view what's happening in the story and i i know it's not a film but like with reality tv they manipulate your emotions so much by by the music and the sounds that they use um, and it's not necessarily the words, and then they add those things are you know they're not real. They're obviously edited beyond belief. Um, but they they you may manipulate your emotions the way you feel about it by creating sounds. And the way someone says like, "Oh, that was a great job," the way the music is in the background can make us think that that was either being a sarcastic statement or it was like an actual like compliment to the person in the show or whatever. Um, and I think with films, the the way that we utilize music and um, background noise and sounds and everything has such an impact on what we view. And with dialogue there, it's, it's not as present to us. But I think when you take the dialogue out, then you start to re realize how much that sound has an effect on your viewing of that film. And the dialogue itself, if we watch a foreign film without subtitles, then the, the dialogue is part of the music. Yeah. And you hear through inflection, which is what you're t saying, you mm -hmm. hear through inflection what the story is. Just we don't have to know what the words mean, but we yeah. hear it. One of my favorite things is to just let the same movie play over and over and over yeah. and, and not watch it and not watch it. Just listen to it. Yeah. Um, so it's funny you say that because um, other class, so there was two classes. We, we, everyone knows we have other multiple class, master classes. Um, the one with Aaron Sorkin, he talks about dialogue being like music to him. Yeah, and it is. For, for it's, it's not just the words and telling a story, but it's like it should have a rhythm, it should have a beat, and it should, when you hear it, sound just as good as a song does, which I think is, I mean, very cool and like a very like, interesting way to think about it. Um, and then in, I believe it's Dustin Hoffman's Masterclass, he talks about silent films and why they're so important to actors to watch them um, because it, it shows, one, it's totally different for acting. It's a totally different style of acting in that you're not using words and to convey your emotions, but it's really about your face and like what you do with your body. Um, but also, it's just such a great history to see what filmmaking was like, you know, in a time when they were limited by certain technologies, um, which I think is so true for filmmaking here and what Warner's class is about. Constraints are a very good point because we're always going to face them. They faced them in the oops, the silent era. We're, we're going to face them now. So anyone that is going to say, oh, well, this, this is too hard or I can't have this or I can't do that. You have to just sweep the kitchen with whatever you have access to, and whether it's stuff or your own creativity. You've got to sweep the kitchen, put it in there. You may only have an egg and a pickle and <laughs> and a fork <laughs> and some sour milk, but that's what you have. Right. Use it. You know? Well, and don't think that because you have the fancy gadget or you don't have the fancy gadget that that's going to affect the quality of your film. Yeah. Um, it's we we all have. I mean, we have access to crazy amounts of, like Werner said, you know, with a laptop and a phone, you can make a real, you know, quote unquote, real film, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, Did anybody read? Oh, this is advanced. The, you know, not it's not advanced thinking. It's one of the later classes. Blink. Did anybody uh, read that yet? 
Mm -hmm. Was uh, using the cell phone um, depends what gadget we use, what end result we want, whether it's cinema, television, or a device. So we do need we can make a film with a phone, but we have to think what's what's the end result? Like where is that going to show? Mm -hmm. Just a yeah. tangent, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's, a, that's an important point. You're, um, you're definitely communicating something specific when you're using a, a phone. And how you frame, oh, that's a different, mm -hmm. that's later, okay. <laughs> sorry, well, it's just um, on my mind. The interesting thing about that is, did anyone see, what was it, it was Tangerine? Yeah. Was that, was that movie that was shot completely on an iPhone? And if you guys haven't seen it, it's, it's really, it's great. But um, it was like a Sundance darling or whatever, and it was completely shot on an iPhone, but that, you can tell like when you're watching it you can tell it's 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 shot on a camera that's not made for you know intense filmmaking but um the way they filmed it and the way they did it and edited it and everything it's it, it's part of the story and it feels more real and genuine it's really great um cool. I really love it but i want I, i'm going to read a couple comments from the chat room about this topic of um not having dialogue um so andrew says you become a lot more cognizant of how the film is being told visually without dialogue you can notice all the little subtleties in the actors faces um and this happened to him by accident while watching the last samurai and the subtitles didn't show up he really had to pay attention to the acting in order to understand what was going on between the characters um john ellsworth says you have to focus on the visuals um you, i've done it a lot first time i saw la age d'or i cannot sorry i don't speak french um, it had no subtitles and it was quite an experience. Um, and last thing I want to read Naomi's comment says, yes, along the lines with Alana's listening point, I've been making concerted effort uh, to listen more closely to all dialogue for all movies and TV shows I watch. Focusing on listening to dialogue puts a different perspective on the film or show. So, yeah. Cool. Just wanted to read Dialogue does those. change depending upon whether it's TV, film, which genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to move us on to the next discussion topic, which is from lesson three. And lesson three is when um, Werner talks about the Peregrine, um, and you guys were given the assignments before the class intensive started to um, you know read the book. So hopefully you guys have read it. Um, but just let me want to talk about it a little bit and J. A. Baker's like novel and how his writing transforms his, sub his subjects into something beyond simply birds. How does he do that? Um, what aspects of the peregrines and the surrounding nature did Baker most intentionally watch and describe? But in general, just like, what did you guys think of the book? And um, how did you think you can apply what was talked about it into your filmmaking? Kari has to go to first, first on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was strange at first is it took me a while to get into the rhythm and the description and the level of abstraction that uh, there was a lot of talk of color and shape of the birds as they were flying, hunting, bathing in their different activities. And there, there is this sense of, of repetition. I mean, the, the animals, they do the same thing every day in different variations. And there's, you'd think that there are only so many ways you could describe a hunt, but there aren't. Each time it seemed new and invigorating. Uh, and like you were right there and everything but the birds dropped away and the birds, the landscape, the weather. Um, and it, as soon as I got into it, I, it was addictive. I actually kind of wanted to go back and reread it. Um, having such a keen eye for the way that birds behave. I mean, they're little dinosaurs. It's a completely different mindset and being able to get into that and realizing, he, sort of, he doesn't reflect on it as much, but realizing that humans are kind of disgusting in a way, getting to that point. Um, in terms of, of seeing, identifying with the subject, but not, not getting uh, sentimental about it was uh, really key. Alana Clark, what did you guys think? Well, well I... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I, it took me a while to get into it. I would say it probably took me a good half the book or more, uh, maybe a half to two thirds of the book. I, I found myself really having to kind of push. Um, but somewhere along the line, uh, I really, really was profoundly affected and touched by that book. And by the end of it, it, it really had me reeling. Um, I, I was surprised, actually. Uh, it took me by surprise uh, how much that book 
uh, impacted me and what it and what an effect it had. I think I could I could speak about it for at, at length, but a couple things that really stand out. One, as it pertains especially to anybody creating anything, I was particularly uh, impressed, or I don't know, impressed, but just it I, it, it it how how he clearly had, not clearly, but he had a specific point of view. And if you read a little bit of history, he was really concerned about these birds being killed off, um, about their extinction. And that was really important to him from like, uh, what, like insecticides or something were killing yeah. these falcons. But in the reading of this book, it was almost completely uh, the didactic voice, which is so common, this ideology overcoming uh, aesthetics was almost completely absent from this book, which is exceptionally rare. It wasn't didactic. It wasn't propaganda. It was simply through absolute aesthetic arrest that he conveyed his perspective, which I think is so rare. So that really stood out to me. The other thing that really stood out to me was his, was this, it was an exceptional example of artistic empathy and how he so empathized with this subject and from that perspective was able to write such extraordinarily beautiful work. Uh, and I think that that's also you know, pretty important as a filmmaker to have that empathetic openness to, to your content or your, your characters, whatever it is, your story that you're telling to life actually. So those two things especially stood out to me. Cool. I love that Clark, the, the empathy for everything. I even felt it with the foliage. I mean, the every everything that he described, he had empathy with. It was amazing for me. Uh, I was taken immediately, so there was no like, did I need to get into it? I I loved it from the get go. It was a meditation to me. Um, I'm just um, I haven't been reading a lot of long form books lately, so I was just taking little bites at night before bed and. It was lasting a long time, this book. <laughs> it was quite a long meal. Um, and, but it was so gentle. And it was, I would t carry it with me the next day, not the book, but the, the thinking. Um, I grew up in a small town of like 500 people. It was an old mining town. And I used to go out on walks and I used to ride my pony and do very much the same thing. So it wasn't new territory for me, but what it did do was enhance my noticing. And I think that was the point of the book for us to enhance our noticing. Um, the conclusion, as I was going through, I was wondering, well, how is he going to wrap this up? Mm -hmm. It was such a gentle conclusion. Oh. It almost, I didn't even know it was a conclusion. It was, but then what was funny is that um, a friend of mine had that kind of, con I, I don't, I don't want to like be a spoiler. Like, have we, are we all saying that we've read the book? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but that gentle moment of acknowledgement at the end. A friend of mine just coincidentally shared a story about a deer with that kind of moment, and there's something that I think humans really long for to have a moment of acknowledgement by a wild thing. That we are the wild thing too, but we don't. Nobody acknowledges that because we're so busy being civilized. Well, it, that's what I got. So used to being feared in a way. I mean, the the whole setup of how the most terrible thing to happen to these animals would be uh, intervention by a human being. So to be regarded um, without that primal fear is sort of you've achieved this level of you know I've I've risen above or distinguished myself from the rest of humanity to be treated yeah. as a peer, something close. Something, but yeah, exactly. So a wonderful wrap up for that book. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I wanna read a couple of the comments from the chat room. Andrew says, at first he didn't just get the point, of, he, didn't, he just didn't get the point of the assignment. Um, I reached the end of the point and kind of left my scratch in my head. Then today I was on a mountain trail scouting a location for my film and I saw a huge owl perched on a branch and that's when it clicked. There's a lot of majesty in his subject material and he adequately captures that. But it's something that I think you really have to see to understand. Did you guys feel like when you 
maybe read the book because two of you said that like, you, it wasn't at first got it but do you think when you saw things in nature in real life that it brought back some of the things that you'd read in the book yeah uh, yeah for sure i mean i think like alana said this was like as i was reading it you know even even before i got fully into it i it was yeah it stayed with me it, it really stayed with me and i think a, a meditation is a really nice uh expo like a uh, descriptive kind of word for the feeling that i had with it but yeah i think it it, my eyes kind of opened a little wider. My ears kind of opened a little more. It really reminded me of like uh, my wife took me to this uh, like last year, this 10 day long silent meditation retreat off in the middle of nowhere in 29 Palms. And it was like no talking, no cell phones, no Internet, no reading, no writing. Uh, it was like meditating 10 hours a day. You, it was complete silence, no outside. And it was just it was extraordinary by like the third day what a song what a what the song of a bird would mean to you outside when you heard not you know and it and so this it really took me back to that place like what it took 10 days of silence to to kind of create in me i mean it really did it heightened my sensitivity quite a bit so i have a yeah. technical point that i hate to even bring up after such a beautiful description <laughs> did i i as i started reading the book i connected and it was just beautiful nature moments, but it was an endless shot list to me. My mind was going through each line thinking, you know, oh, I, framing is here, framing is here, framing. Was that a common reaction for others, I wonder? I was thinking about it as being a, sort of a, a, a prose script for uh, animation, that there was mm. that level of detail in each of the shots where you, could, you, you couldn't actually make this from um from video it, but there was enough in there to construct every day or at least the segments of every day that he focused on so yeah it's uh, for me it was getting used to the rhythm of the days as the season changed and as the behaviors changed i think once i locked onto that suddenly See, everything was very vivid the, the seasons at all <laughs> i just and it's funny because i love structure but i didn't I did not, because I was reading them in such short, the book in such short bits, I just really didn't pay attention to the timeline. Um, I was just so in the moment, kind of like, oh no, movie moment in uh, Aguirre when the boat's up in the tree. I was still in the dream. Oh. If you guys watched Aguirre, yeah. where the boat's up in yeah. the dream, and it's a question yeah. of whether it's, they're, they're hallucinating or not. I was in the hallucination. And yeah. for the peregrine, I was in the, the, it's not a hallucination, but I was in those visuals without any constriction of time, probably because of the way I was reading it. I wonder if you read it in, you know, long, longer sittings instead of taking little bites like you did, how your perspective would change. I yeah, mean, it's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. Yeah. Um, a couple other comments in the chat room. Naomi says, it uh, took her a while to get into Baker's rhythm, his style of repetition, his use of neologisms. Um, she was honestly in awe of Baker's ability to describe everything he sees, hears, and thinks with spectacular visual detail and precision. It took her longer to finish than initially planned, but she's glad she finished. It's a literary masterpiece and never any book like it. Never read any book like it. Um, John says, Baker begins to identify with the peregrines and to me focuses on the hunting and eating of the bird's prey. He starts to almost see himself as a hawk. The ending especially gets to me where he goes to find the hawk before they migrate. Great book. He saw strong parallels with Grizzly Man. Have you guys seen uh, Grizzly Man? Mm -hmm. Did you see any parallels between this book and Grizzly Man? I mean, I imagine that since Werner says this is like the book you have to read of make filmmaking, there's probably elements of it in every film that he makes. But with Grizzly Man in particular, did you guys see anything in there? Yeah, I, the practicality of death. I mean, death is part of... I'm death obsessed in everything I see or do. But um, the, the Peregrine really helped me to understand. I understand death. I'm a grown up, but I emotionally, in my heart, I can't bear to even kill a spider. So to hear about these birds and how they're plucked, and it, I needed that repetition to get past the the pain I felt when I read it to accept that this is nature. And in the Grizzly, Grizzly Man movie, 
the same thing. It, it's just, this is nature. And Timothy may have had good intentions and was trying to be, he wasn't trying to be Jay Baker, but they had similarities. Nature's going to continue. Yeah. So that was common in both. That's a good way of putting it. It's, it's also just the sort of bog standard man in relation to nature, how Baker put himself in relation to the peregrine versus the way that Timothy was Good point. Putting himself in with the bears, making himself part of them when Baker was acutely aware he, how right. much ever he wanted to be, he was not actually a falcon. That's an excellent distinction. Very different, yeah, interactions with nature. Naomi says, I kind of thought Baker had a love-hate relationship with the birds in the sense that I felt he was jealous of the birds' freedom and their ability mm. to fly away. Oh, yeah. That's mm. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I wish I could fly away. <laughs> don't we all? I mean, don't we all want to fly? <laughs> yeah. I see it every day. There's lots of screaming and flying, and it really yeah. it looks like a blast. Yeah. Feel the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To be a wild thing and not flying, it just and I guess I think of myself as a wild thing. It's just and not being able to fly, it's just painful. Yeah. Sandberg has a quote that I always just mash up. Uh, Carl Sandberg. Um, of being a, a sea creature stuck on land wanting to fly in the air. That's my twisting of it. But I mean, that's what I thought of throughout this peregrine. I just wanted to go up and catch that uh, bit of what is it, warm air, and then you can go and soar higher and higher. I just wanted that. I thought that Baker communicated flight so well. Even at the gym, I've been trying to feel my my bird muscles <laughs> need to develop those just in case one day I can just really take off. That's right. Yeah. There, what I really liked was that the, sometimes to get away from the peregrine that the birds would actually take to flight and how that made them more susceptible to the hunt. So it's yeah. it, 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 flying as this imperative flying is this, absolutely uh critical to life but it it also brought them to their death in some ways so it's like it's it's that whole nature um there it's not something very morality. deep just registered for me with what you're saying and i'm not sure what it is but i really want to sit in that cycle of nature that gives something flight that will give them life but the same flight will give them death it's oh and the part in the book where the one peregrine, did I read this white right, was testing himself and just whoop. Did I did I misread that like, or was, no, I was upset? No. I didn't want to reread it. <laughs> no, they it's and it's something that I've seen with, with birds or any kind of uh, predator that they they have to train themselves, they have to keep the skills up. Cause that's it's critical. I mean, they might not always get that kind of challenge every day, but it's, uh, but that one was an epic fail in the Peregrine, and it yeah. did actually hit, oh. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I don't like to watch violent things, and I don't want it snuck into my books. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a, I mean, it's, the, it's a whole book of violence. It's, um, I, but that was the interesting thing for me. I was able to make that leap of now when I see carcasses, and now I'm seeing them everywhere, the birds. <laughs> um, I... I, I tell myself that's just that's not horrific. That's something that needs to happen for the cycle to continue. Yeah. Although I really want to stop eating meat, and I can't. <laughs> I, so, don't, I don't know that humans need that cycle, but uh, yeah, um, the practicality in that book was just priceless for me. And I think just to, just a couple quick things, if I may. I think as a like a, Fred, your original question was. Refresh my memory, actually. What was your original question? Uh, the original question was, like, yeah, generally, what did you think of it? And then also, the um, how does Baker's writing transform yeah. subjects into something sim beyond simply birds? And what aspects of the peregrines and the surrounding nature did Baker most intensely watch and describe? Okay. Like, I, the thought there was something, I thought there was some other question about kind of how did it translate to filmmaking or, okay, yeah. That was my question. That was my question generally. Like, how do you feel like the, what he talks about in the yeah. book? But, but uh, I would I would say you know a couple things stood out to me. One, I thought that it was really interesting that you could have such a it's a reminder that you can have a profoundly compelling story 
that is not all about plot machinations, which is what so much of what we see on TV and film today is plot machination after plot machination after plot contrivance. Holy shit. Yeah. Sorry, you can't tell how I feel about that. So that's, yeah. that's one. Two, the, there's okay. no goddamn dialogue in this at all. It is pure <laughs> visual storytelling. Pure visual storytelling. And he doesn't interact I, with them either, right? He doesn't. And I think he doesn't oh, feed he does. or talk to them or do anything, right? And I think it's that pure. Yeah, and I think that those two things speak very loudly to me. It's a reminder that yes, you can have a story that's not a three act story that doesn't have like your A story and your B story and your C story and your inciting incidents and all this other like premeditated horse pucky that like just drives some the, people nuts. That's there's one. There's a time and there's a place for that stuff. Two, and yeah. Aaron, Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin would hate me. Yeah. But you can, you can, I, I think that, that movies used to be called moving pictures. They're moving oh, pictures. Yeah. And the reason yeah. they're moving pictures is because it's a visual storytelling medium. And it's, there. yes, sound is important. And yes, things, things make noises and people speak. But when you get into telling your story through 15 minutes in, in every, you know, or uh, wrong, let's say three quarters of your two hour movie is people exposition, telling story through exposition, it makes me want to go nuts. This was such a beautiful example of how you don't have to do either one of those things to have a great story. Okay, there. Right. <laughs> I Can agree I with so note? much of it. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. I've been... Uh... He, I don't know if you've gotten to the part in the course where... Uh, <laughs> Naomi <laughs> loves horse punky. <laughs> where Herzog talks about the documentary and how it's not journalism. Baker was interacting. He was yeah. clapping. He was approaching them. He was chasing, he was chasing them on he his was bike. Chasing them. Was, yeah. yeah. They were acutely aware of him. Yeah. And he was manipulating, I mean, if I want to use that strong a word, but he really was manipulating their behavior so that he could observe he it. So but it he, wasn't like this perfect. No, it wasn't perfect, but he wasn't doing like what people do with like, luring birds i remember no, when i was no, a, wasn't doing that yeah yeah like when i was a kid we had a bird watching thing and what the they had us go to someone's house and sit there at the picture window and look at a bird feeder it was appalling you know like that is not bird watching and mm. he <laughs> was actually that. well that's a good that's a good point too and as it relates i think you can really see where Werner would be really attracted to this because you know Werner out in in the rivers of peru you know, I'm not in a set, I'm not in a studio, I need to be here and I need to experience this. That that really like get your hands dirty in the earth kind of, you have to live this in order to, that's part of the filmmaking process, your living of it shows up in the film. Same mm -hmm. with this, he could have just written this by watching birds out of his window. I mean, he could have tried, right? It would have been the same book by any stretch, no, but he could, have, have. he could have tried to have written a book like, I'm gonna watch the documentary films on birds, or I'm gonna read a few books on films or, or, or birds, or I'm gonna like look out a window, but he immersed himself. And I think even though it presents itself as like a winter in the book, I think actually it's about 10 years of bird yeah. observation that he made to write this book. And I think that speaks volumes. You've really got to immerse yourself in your subject. Live so, it. Clark, that's the perfect example of getting back to a soldier of cinema yeah. and having that heart of a soldier. You know, a yeah. heart to someone. It's you can't. You don't develop that heart by looking out a window at a bird feeder. You have to right. go for ten years and spend this time. You have to be affected. You have to be affected. You have to yeah. allow yourself to be affected profoundly. You have to yeah. be moved. And if you and don't march, experience something, you cannot be moved. Yeah, and that's, marching through the fields every day. Yeah, you have to be moved. And I think that's, you know, when I think of soldier, I think of courage. And courage yeah. is not something that fear is not here. Courage is you act in spite of fear. And I think yeah. one, of the, one of the most courageous things that an artist can do is be exceptionally vulnerable. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable so enough to hard. be moved, to so be moved. Hard. That's what gave Baker the ability. It wasn't that his language, I and mean, yes, his language was was quite nice. But what made that unique was his level, the level to which he was moved. That he allowed himself to be vulnerable and empathize with the with nature, with these creatures, even with his own nature, with his own nature as part of this landscape. 
that's what was so that's what made this unique that's what that's why we're talking about it now however many years later uh in my mind in my mind i know i'm saying this pretty definitively but of course my opinion (laughs) no that's why we're here man in in the book he was he, he was writing where I, in kind of an omniscient point of view for a while, but then he broke the fourth wall and he started putting in his own personal things. I don't know at what point in the book I was at because I was reading on a Kindle. (laughs) And like I said, little chunks. So I have no idea when it actually changed. But it was jarring for me when he actually started putting his, his personal stuff, started like crossing over into this meditation. Um, at first, I didn't like it, but that part, then I got kind of used to it because it was only sprinkled in. It wasn't too indulgent. All right, I'm going to move it. This has been, all, honestly, one of the best chats I've had just listening to you guys talking about this. It's really great. Dude, you've got to read the book now. I know, I've got it. I know. We're going to call Brad out. We're calling Brad out. Didn't yeah, read I'm book, reading it everybody. tonight, you guys. I'm going to go get it and read it. Um, I think it's just, you guys... Clearly, like it was a great book, and you guys all loved it, and like there's so much to gain from it. So I'm gonna go out and read it. Um, because I'm gonna move us on to the next. Our it's five fifty. Yeah, aren't we almost time. out of time? And we yeah, we're like to running out of time. So I'm gonna move us to our last like discussion topic for a lesson, which is from lesson four. Um, and we kind of touched on this a little bit with what Clark brought up about the three act structure. And um, in lesson four, Herzog challenges the traditional three act structure that's taught in schools. Um, he basically says it leads to like mediocre and predictable films. And so um, I wanted, we wanted to know like, what is you guys think about the three act structure? Are you used to working with it? What are the, you know, the pros and cons of it? And then really talking about Werner's approach. So how does taking his approach and make it more difficult or simple to write and think through your film? So let's talk about the three act structure first. Go ahead, Alana. <laughs> okay. Uh, in a nutshell, we need to understand storytelling. This has been before people even had paper, storytelling existed. So we need to understand this part of story. You, you can't just do a story like this. That's how I tell a joke like that. And nobody ever gets my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> See, nobody goes. So you've got to understand structure in some way. And if you don't feel it innately, like some people really have it innately. I don't know if it's the way they're brought up or whatever. If you don't, you need to learn it. Uh, my opinion. In um, the week two video, I'm sorry, I'm going to read this. Um, Werner advises precision of understanding the flow of a story for anyone who wants to make films. Okay, to me that says you need to understand stories. So have it innately or learn learn a layer of storytelling structure, sorry, then throw it away and then take this advanced layer this advanced version of yourself and roll out a richer story but if you just go i don't know anything about storing and storytelling and i want to break the rules and i don't know anything and i'm just going to go and do nothing you know just it's going to be chaos it's going to be crap which is the problem <laughs> yeah, i mean you think about chaos think of, can be interesting yeah you think about shakespeare so no, I hate structured. Shakespeare. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but think think of it this way. It's an iambic pentameter. The, the the language is structured. There's an act structure, there's a scene structure, but what he accomplishes within that framework is amazing or, you know, boring as you think. But there is something No, no, there. no, no, no. He it, it is good. Yeah. I just it, the, the music yeah. of it doesn't speak to me. So you have to learn it's one of those things you have to learn grammar before you can write poetry and then you can decide what you want to throw away. It's but you have to have studied you know, Picasso studied anatomy. He drew a lot before he was able to get into... You know, that's a perfect point. Cubism, it's, yeah. You don't have to go to a, f- a film school or a class or read books on structure. Just, there are many ways to learn things and, and just bringing those experiences to your stories might innately influence how you tell your film. It may not be like my jokes, which are flat. It may actually have some arcs of interest. The thing is you have to have conflict or you don't have any story. That sounds like a thing, but you're always going to need something, some point of interest to break up my flat line of jokes. Well, I think somebody's going to take, that's going to be a good takeaway, right? Just, don't tell jokes like her. Just, I mean, just to, I, I, I think that it's, it's interesting. I don't, you know, I really don't know. Uh, this is, I'm, I don't, I'm just thinking out loud because I don't know exactly what I think. It, this is fluid. Um, 
You know, I think that, I, uh, I think personally that we're storytelling machines, actually, all of us. And you, you mentioned that, like some people have innately, I think we all do. I think we tell stories every day, all the time. I think our entire lives are, are stories that we've told ourselves, our interpretations of our memories. I think we're storytelling machines. And so I actually think, and, and story, story emanates from humans. We, we've, we tell stories all the time. We just, we just learn to, to wrap this thing called a three-act structure. It is a model that we've used to describe stories after the fact. People were telling stories long before somebody had codified it into these things like three-act structure or inciting incidents or character arcs or anything like that. That's after the fact. These things existed in storytelling long before we codified them. Um, Clark, Clark now, I've got to ask you, though. Okay, I completely agree with all of that. But when you get somebody that's so passionate and wants to tell stories, but then their mind shuts down because they're faced with the, uh, the blank page or the, you know, onion, what do they do? You okay, know, what do they well, do I don't know. Get I don't know what I don't know what they do. I think yeah. I think that this is I think it's common. First of all, I think and I don't think it has to do for lack of an infrastructure in that sense. Um, I, there's a difference, I think, between giving yourself obstructions or restrictions like a haiku is a restriction for writing. I'm going to allow myself only so much room and that's going to uh, give me focus. I think yeah. that's a different thing than I must, I'm going to read these books, how to write stories, and I'm going to read Save the Cat or some horse fucky like that. And that's how films are made. Um, I, how, so I how feel do you like, go from like a vignette though? Like if somebody just goes out with a camera and they don't know anything about story and they see, don't I that's have where I would get, That's where I would posit an argument. I, I would say that they do know about story. I, again, I, I think maybe it's overly optimistic, but I think that actually we are storytelling machines. I think we do it all the time. I think we do it every day. I think we tell stories to our parents, our children. <laughs> our this is so much fun. Parents. Okay. I'm, you but know, I, I, you don't want to show the chicken wire underneath the paper mache surface, see, do, which and, is and the and structure. Is, and no, I like that. You know. And I, I mean, well, okay. I don't know. I, I think the things that stick with me the longest are the things that are not quite, I, 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 mm, I love dreamlike logic in a film. Let me say it this way, another way. Films that really speak to me, that really touch me in a very visceral, non-conceptual, non-intellectual way to touch me in my heart, my gut, my groin, like viscerally touch me and move me are films that generally don't have much plot, um, are, are like a dreamlike logic. They don't make much sense when you try to intellectualize them or understand them conceptually. They're more kind of this subconscious kind of stirring. They're almost primordial. And maybe that's- They linger, they linger. And, and those are the things that move me, I get. And obviously we're all moved by different things, of course. I just me personally. So for me I gotta, personally, I gotta jump back to where we were for one second to make a point um, because I actually am on the same page with you. I'd say for most things, I'm just playing like devil's advocate or whatever sure, it is. I'm totally. doing the contrary. Totally. Home movies. Yeah. So yeah. People put together a lot of home movies, and we know sure. how you know torturous that is to have to watch somebody else's home movies. So. You know, and they're going to think they're great because, uh, well, you know, it's let's not get too. I mean, look, uh, of course, we can take any argument to the extreme. That's the emotional I, I think, attachment. I think yeah, that, that is it. It's the emotional. Oh, and that's the other thing. Don't shoot your like um, people you love because you can't have separation. Everything looks great when you look at people you love. Yeah. We're stepping so all I, over Clark. I hope you don't think I was like no, picking on you. I don't. No, of course not. Not even remotely no, close. I, I think, and I think that you know, it's like it's like when it's like this. Let me try to to use something that Werner said to explain how I'm speaking here in general. So Werner's like talking about uh, storyboards, and he's like, ah, storyboards are for cowards. Ah, you know, don't use them. <laughs> But we get where he's coming from. Yeah, we get that. There are instances where you need to use them. And yes, you're not a horrible coward that shouldn't be making cinema if you use them here and there. Well, he's, he's speaking to something, I think, a little deeper, which is don't premeditate everything. Don't pre-visualize everything. Don't shut yourself off from 
being open to that wonderful thing that is accidental inspiration, those accidents that happen on, you know, yeah. in front of you, be open to those in every moment. So yeah. try to take that. He's speaking about something different. This is how I'm speaking about story structure now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it is. and I, I'm on the same page with you. I, um, I, I just want to make sure that um, people understand when when Werner says to do all of those things you were just saying, he's trying to give us an example of build up your personal foundation so you have mm -hmm. something to draw from, something that influences how you see, how you notice, and that Peregrine teaches us to notice. Mm -hmm. Don't be a um, loser. <laughs> don't be a loser. Is that what don't you be said? a loser. Don't be a loser, yes. Um, 601, what are we going to do now? We didn't um, get to talk with anybody about assignments. I know. I know. We, we got too caught up in talking about everything in the discussion talks. I just want to bring in a couple and of the I comments. I want to talk about assignments, darn it. <laughs> I want to bring in a couple of the comments from the chat room real quick um, about the three-act structure. Um, Naomi says, I'm a fan of structure. I think there needs to be some level of structure in a film. Honestly, I think the three-act structure leads to too much predictability. I think a great film is one where I don't see where the ending is heading. And I think that speaks to a little bit what you guys are saying is like, yeah, that's, it's great to have it, but you don't have to follow it exactly and you can break the rules. Yeah, I um, think if a person just layers their life experiences, learn all kinds of things, but you layer your creativity and then a decade goes by and you look back on these many layers of creativity and you're so much richer in how you notice and how you do things and what you put on the page or canvas or film. I don't know what that was attached to, but I was just feeling like I needed to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, last comment I want to read before we move on to assignments. Um, Andrew says, the funny thing is that when I try to focus, force, or sorry, excuse me, force a three-act structure on my story, I feel very constrained and restricted. When I'm just writing a story for the sake of it, I wind up with a three-act structure accidentally. Yes. So I think trying too hard to make it fit the structure when you already have an idea can actually sabotage it. Yeah, Do you guys agree? Point. And he might have a facility with the three-act structure that you know, this person over here does not have. Mm -hmm. It depends where we oh, are in our... I think we all, uh, yeah. I'll be a devil's <laughs> advocate. I, th I think we all do. We, I think we, three-act structure just means this, really. It just means the story has a beginning, a middle, a middle and, an and, end. End. and we all get that. I think it's, I think that we can... With look, some, co with so some conflict videos, in there, look, you're, you're that a you really, have to resolve. Really, you're a really intelligent person, it, which is clear, and I think so many of us are, and I think that we have sometimes tendencies to over-intellectualize, analyze, conceptualize from this part of our body. Yeah, and that's think, creative death. And I think that this this structure and mapping stuff, because trust me, I've been, like, I speak from experience for myself that I have gone down that road, but it, yeah, but just another perspective, yeah. Cool. I think we um, share the same perspective. So <laughs> wait a minute, Alana. I've got a. I've got a. Uh, I guess how this this plays into your joke telling, but a key setup for a joke is that you repeat something three times, yeah, and then you get the yeah. punchline. The old jokes. Yeah. So there yeah. you've got that structure. So it's the anticipation. You're like, oh, oh, it's coming. What's it gonna be? So yeah, I mean, it is it is sort of something that we're set up to do, but. Um, you know, those are corny jokes, which isn't necessarily what we're doing w with film. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> uh, I'm sure mine's going to be pretty corny for this, so don't, yeah. <laughs> Hold me to so, that. So you're trying to say, Kari, that the, um, the, the old school uh, structure for joke telling is similar to the uh, traditional three-act structure for storytelling, and that they don't have a place in contemporary film. Oh, no, no. I mean, I mean, there's totally a place for it, but you have to be conscious of what you're communicating. If I'm telling an old style corny joke, it's an old style corny joke. I don't know that there's a way to put a modern spin on it or... Um, you're I mean, talking I to somebody that can't tell a joke, remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, I'm, but I'm aware of the, the form that I'm using. Um, yeah, that, absolutely, yeah. You, if, if we know what, who our audience is going to be, we're hoping, and what, the, what kind of story we're telling, then we can figure out what kind of foundation we want to put it on. And that might be a more free-flowing, dreamlike story with certain arcs and ebbs and flows. Is that essentially what we're trying to say that so we don't have this confining feel to a three-act structure? Mm -hmm. don't, don't try to fit your narrative to a three-act structure if you're going 
I don't think anyone should really force their stuff into a three act structure. I think that's what's happening in some cases, and that's where the mediocrity is coming from. I'm pretty uh, sure that's happening with every movie that you see in a theater on wide release. Yeah. Wait, let me, let me say, in, in Werner's class, I don't think any of us are, are really trying to squish our stuff into a three act. Sorry, I, right. I needed, yeah. Yeah, yeah we we're know still Hollywood. selecting, though. That's, Pardon? we're a self-selecting group. For exactly. sure, very self-sufficient. <laughs> so, so what we're trying to do, I think the bigger obstacle for most of us is to accept this feeling of freedom of ebbing and flowing and not having to constrain ourselves with the three-act structure. But there are gonna be people out there that don't know how to tell a story. And I know for me, it's going to be an exploration of letting myself into this dreamlike world, even though I'm a very esoteric person. So. It's going to be scary for a lot of people out there, as much fun as we're having. And I just, I just want people to know that it's okay to try things and then not work out. Well, yeah, I mean, for that sure. partner just slammed its body into the ground. and um, Yeah, <laughs> I'm preferably not that, but that will happen, you're right. Yeah. And it's okay, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think you're right, it is painful. I don't know, I just, heard, sorry, I, but it is, it is painful, and I think, I think that I know in my life, I can speak from my own experience, that sitting down, you, you, cause I think a lot of you kind of said, well, what do you tell somebody who's sitting down and they're looking at that blank page and it's like, what do I do? Yeah, yeah it, boy. Gotta get yeah. Rolling some and, of that. that's the, and that's the challenge that each and every one of us, of course, has to face on our own, ultimately alone. It's almost like facing death. It's like, I know it sounds very dramatic, but creation in a way is that intense. And I think that it's really, in the same way that we, most of us, at some, look for some kind of way to help us deal with death. Whatever your religious beliefs are, whatever your thoughts are on afterlife or this or that or the other thing, I think that creation is the same kind of thing. Cre you know, destruction and creation are just different sides of the same coin. When we sit to create, I think that it's extremely enticing to look for infrastructure that somebody else can show us to, to like drape our ideas on to give us some kind of safety some kind of a key thing that you said there drape our ideas on getting back to yeah. Werner's class sorry i interject um but Werner is really trying to hit home that we don't need the three act structure and we don't need storyboards because he is furnishing us with classes that spell out how to enrich ourselves as artists. And for anyone to skip the steps and then say, oh, I'm just going to break the rules, but they haven't built up their own um, richness of self. What not rules are able there? To know. Well, I'm just curious, when you say break the rules, what do you mean by that specifically? What rules would a person be breaking if they set out to write a story? I'm using it more as terminology where people just with nothing say, oh, I want to break the rules, which is a way of saying, I don't want to learn how to, um, what's something essential that we need to do in life? Um, just brush forgetting how to do everything right. What? Is it brush my teeth? <laughs> well, I yeah, just wonder, I mean, well, I, I you've got to learn that you need a toothbrush and toothpaste. Oh, well, you could use a stick, but the thing is, when I say break the rules, that, that we should, there's no romance about breaking the rules, to me. I mean, Werner is existing, he's, he's overcoming obstacles, but I think a lot of younger people especially will think break the rules means it's fine to throw away how to write a sentence, how to um, have any kind of cohesiveness. Oh, we're out? No, no, you're still, you're still on the car, you just got dropped off, okay. she's just coming back. Yeah, she's coming back, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm here um, for sure. <laughs> okay. So I realize, Clark, you and I are on the same page about this whole, you know, Hollywood machine. Um, I just really love Werner's lessons. He gives us ammunition for how to go forward. And if we take those, we'll be richer. And I'm not just a proponent of Werner. I really didn't really know who he was before this, just mm -hmm. vaguely. Mm -hmm. um, we need to build up ourselves in order to have something to offer. 
So that, that that's is what absolutely, I mean. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. Again, I, I just am curious to kind of it's an, an interrogate you just a little bit to better I, no, understand just, what, get, what I, you mean. So many people say break the rules because they're afraid of learning the rules and then right. having that that experience under their belt that bolsters them to take on more layers of learning and experience. And then you're, it's just amazing the creativity that can happen when you have layers of structure. If, okay, if it's, not, if it's the three act structure that somebody has a problem with, fine. But whatever, whatever people are rebelling against, I would encourage people to look at why they're rebelling against it. What might they learn from that that they can enrich themselves with? Because our stories are going to reflect resistance or they're boring. I mean, otherwise they're what, like buttercups and uh, fireworks or something. Fireworks are the most boring thing in the world to me. <laughs> what, what, tell, me tell me you're going to take me to fireworks and you're going to see my face glaze over. There has to be something underneath the fireworks. All right, and with that, I'm going to move us on to the assignment <laughs> discussions. Um, just wanted to see. So, are I mean, we running a little over time? Current. Just wanted to see. She she got dropped out. She's having internet issues. She just had in the chat room that she's completely frozen when she tries to join. So nothing's happening for her. So oh, she'll okay. be out for the lot for the end of it, which is unfortunate. But just wanted because she told us about her great um, film project she's working on. Just want to know what you guys are working on. How did you decide? How did you land on the story you're going to tell, and um, where did you find your inspiration? I was doing the um, exercise four, like I, I was. I'm doing my lessons all over the place, and I just did my lesson four set to music and Chinese poetry, and I was working uh, on a, a project that I've been working on for a while, and it just was so great. the 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 music just dropped away. The poetry stayed in my head. Absolutely what Werner said, you raise up, and I learned things about my characters, but then my music stopped after an hour. I thought that I could just hit, you know, play again. That was stupid, because <laughs> what happened is it really broke, like I'm like writing. Broke the focus. Yeah, and what happened is this intensive thing seeped into my head, and I went off for this drive and a walk, and I got a new story about boundaries, which did stem from that exercise about that character I was writing. Um, but it was just amazing how, how rich um, that kind of elevation can, you know, just a rich field to draw from. You're aware, well, for me, it just turned on. But I, I'm, I'm very uh, familiar with that exercise. I really love it. What are you working on, Clark? Uh, so yeah, you know, interesting. We were talking a little bit about confusion. So I'm like doing the the other non-intensive things, and I just did like the 20 page writing, and then I did like the two hour music writing, and then like yesterday, I'm looking at the intensive sheet, and I'm like, oh crap, we have to have an idea for our short film because <laughs> I'm in this other train, right? I'm in this other kind of you know going through the other thing simultaneously. So. So I had a couple ideas, though. I did. I did. Was able. I pulled together some things. I don't have a script yet for it, but but both might actually be documentary. So there may not be so much a script. One is my my wife's father recently passed away, and we've got a memorial for him coming up. He was a probably one of the most unique people I've ever met in my life. He was a really gifted artist. He was a potterer, and he was just. I mean, eccentric as all get out. You know, it's like. He was married four times. My wife has more siblings than I can even imagine. I, I don't even think I've met him all yet. It's like he he thinks like uh, God talked to him in a thunderstorm and that he he believed in like aliens and like, you know, the, all this kind of wild stuff. But he, he was just an extraordinary person. And it was really an experience for me. And my parents are both living. And so it was really an experience for me to to kind of experience through my wife the death of her father. And to see that he lived in this really small community in Oregon, um, the small town called Sisters, and everybody knew him. Uh, it was like one of those tiny little towns. So I'm considering doing a doing a documentary on that. And I don't even know exactly what it would be. I have footage. Actually, he died of Alzheimer's, so it was a. It, we've got a lot of footage of him, kind of saying some of his last 
you know, sharing some of his last thoughts and last moments with with uh, my wife and her siblings. And there's a and I'm going to go shoot some things at this memorial. So that that's one thing that I might do. But I don't know that might that might be a little kind of heavy for me to approach it in, in this context. And then there's another one. This is just wacky. So okay, my wife did a chemical peel on my face. <laughs> that's you, you, yes. In the house, in our house. Do you guys know it? So okay, my so my wife is trained. Like she, she is a plastic surgeon, and so she knows what she's doing. It's not like total wackiness, but oh. she she did a chemical peel in our house. She puts this acid on your face, and and then okay, this was wild. So it kills all the skin on your face, and so for the next like week you look like the walking dead like your skin dies it turns brown it starts to peel off in these huge flakes and it i was surprised at how much this shone a light on my vanity and how isolating this made me feel how self-conscious this made me feel it, I mean, I'm embarrassed actually at how much it showed me. I obsess about these kinds of things and how vain I am. I mean, it, it actually I love really that. scared me. I love the isolation, the vanity. Uh, that's fantastic. So those Did are you my take two any ideas. Video of the skin coming off. Yeah. Did you I take mean, video? It, Did you video yourself with the no? I didn't, skin? but I, I would. I probably do it. I'd do it again, or I'd have, <laughs> or, or or here's another interesting idea to add another layer in it. I might see if my brother would have it done and then he would be my quote unquote actor and I could kind of direct him, so to speak, in his going through this process and see how. So anyway, those are my two ideas that I'm playing with. I like them both. I think I mean, both your projects sound really great. I, I think uh, the one about vanity speaks, I mean, there's multiple layers to that one, right? That could just yeah. be like your own personal experience but with your brother, but then like um, masculinity and vanity in like, American culture too is totally like a separate subject, which is be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. What what could you like drill into? Because this is only a five to ten minute uh, film, right. right? So what can right. you stay focused on and drill into? Yeah. What's the most embarrassing point? That's what I want to know. Do that. Do that. Yeah. I, it, I just it was embarrassing how much time I spent looking in the mirror and how I could not get away from thinking about this and feeling and how affecting this was to me emotionally to have my face look like something that I didn't want other people to see, uh, which it like pains me to say like that's superficial, but. It, it's well, there, really there are people with skin conditions that sure. um, face that every single day. I know. I know. That's why it's embarrassing because clearly it's a pretty tiny, trivial thing, but it affected me significantly. So I'm embarrassed at my own juvenile nature. Well, it's it's universal what you're talking about. I you know I feel that way about things too, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Oh, and just so I didn't come across glib about mine. Um, <laughs> Because it, I made it seem very s simple on my um, post uh, in our group A. I have a post-it note. I'm very much for post-it notes uh, for my idea. But I do have a shot list. And, but what I am going to do is abandon structure, <laughs> even though I love structure. <laughs> and uh, I'm really going to take Werner's lessons on found sources. I'm mm. going to do some research there. Cool. And then I'm going to just go out and do the, you know, method actor, go out in the crowds and watch people and see what I can discover. Um, um, I'm hoping in our next one, if we have another one of these, that we can talk about releases and legal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because that really, for me, is the big obstacle dealing with the legal stuff. You know, I can, I mean, we'll see, but we might be able to get a member from our content team who deals with legal stuff all the time with all of our classes. So maybe we can have yeah, one of them join yeah. the discussion. I actually, I actually know somebody in our group I mean, no, th th it's actually even helped me with some recent legal issue with my like commercial side of shooting stuff for commercial clients. I, I maybe could forward a contact to you uh, and you'd have to see, yeah. obviously I'm not speaking for them. They may or may not want to do it, but this person seems extremely knowledgeable in legal issues and rights issues for filming. And, and they're in that our would group. Be great. Yeah, yeah. Let's, see if we could, let's see if we can put it together. I think that'd be great. Yeah, I, I might be alone I'll shoot this, it but... to you. I, I might be alone in this, but if we're in this intensive class, we should be helping each other out with points like, I, from a creative standpoint, to come up with things, not a problem. I have so many ideas. It's just a matter of picking one and living with it. But there are obstacles for me about gear and legal stuff that I find very intimidating. So what I find intimidating, somebody else is going to find to be very yeah. easy. And that's why we're in this group, right? Totally. Absolutely. Totally. And I think 
I think a key part of being in the class intensive and any I think online learning in general is very difficult when you're at home doing it alone, no matter what the subject is. Yeah. Um, but with this class intensive, with the whole purpose of it is so people can connect with other people in their area or in, not in their area, but like, you know, in the same time zone that they can connect to and chat with yeah. and gain from their expertise. Like we talked yeah. about, I don't know if we talked about this before we went live or if it was after we went live, but there are people in this class who have zero years of experience or are just starting off. And then we have people who have 30, 40, 50 years of experience yeah. who have, you know, been making films forever and have dealt with all the things that you're maybe experiencing for the first time or maybe something you've always struggled with when you're making films. Yeah. Um, the beauty of being online and being connected is that you can ask these people and provide the feedback to one another, um, which you should be doing. And, it, and also the class intensive works better. You learn more when you interact with more people. So the more people that are interacting and engaging with one another, the better it is for everyone involved. Um, so just keep that in mind when you guys are at home working on um, working on this project. I yeah, think I am getting class has been a wonderful experience so far. I just love it. Yeah, and Alana, great. just a quick thought. You know, uh, obviously these kind of officially sanctioned chat things with Mine. Brad, where he's being lost right now. Alana, are you there still? <laughs> I'm here. Um, I'm here. Obviously, those work, but you know, something that that we could try to do. Uh, is you know not in this A group because it's so small, but in the larger face group, you know maybe we could say like, hey, uh, we're trying to put together like a chat session on legal stuff, and we could get like half a dozen people to kind of chat about it from that pool of people on face. So maybe yeah. some things like that, you know, we we don't have to wait just for these official people to uh, organize, but maybe some of us students can organize it. So yeah, I think Brad might want to cut off cut off the yeah. live feed. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and, and uh, say our goodbyes. I'm getting ready to have date night. No, with I meant everybody. that you and I could have talked for a second afterward. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, but this was awesome. I it was a, a real pleasure chatting with all you guys. Um, it was a really fun back and forth. Um, I, it was it was a good time. Hopefully, we can do it again. Yeah, I, I loved it. I hope that you understand that I was having fun and I was not being. Totally, I do. That's that's my nature too. I love okay. to do that because it's okay. it's an exploration, right? I mean, it's yeah. the the discussion is how we kind of find our own way of even thinking about things. It's it's fluid, and so it, this this kind of uh, dialectic is how we refine our own points of view. It's absolutely perfect. And on that note, yeah, on that note, everybody. bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Hopefully you can hear me. Bye.